Welcome to the Hack AF channel today under the title Patching Democracy. Um, today we're talking about the um, era of digitalization um, as well as about the um, yeah, understanding of the enormous importance of um, digital tools in both private and public life. Um, because like we needed to reduce the world's complexity to um, an amount that we can actually handle. Um, this is something that is very important, for example, in democracies, um, especially when talking about um, decision making. Like, um, for example, the voting advice application that we have in Germany, the Valumat, um, is a very good example of making parties comparable to um, like common people all over the place. Um, but those machines are like those Valumats are very expensive, and thus they are only available for like larger um, elections and. Um, this is a problem that is actually um, handleable. <laughs> this is what Till Sander does with his um, voting advice application that is called. Um, wait uh, a second. No? Uh, <laughs> with his open election compass. Um, he actually was approached by the small city of Lüdenscheid um, to um, develop something that could um, actually do something that the Valumat also does. And when he found out that um, this is actually something that needs to be provided also for smaller elections and that is actually affordable, he, he is actually a web designer, um, decided to do it in a bigger in a bigger way. So he wanted to make it um, open source and thus created his platform that he now talks about in his lecture um, that we um, provide to you right now. You can uh, also ask questions that will be um, yeah, uh, answered in the following Q&A um, on Twitter as well as on the um, IRC um, under the hashtag RC3Hack and um, the channel tagged RC3-Hack. Now enjoy the talk. Welcome to Patching Democracy. This is a short introduction to applications like the German Valomat and why we might not need to hack democracy. In this talk, I will demonstrate how we can improve elections and political education everywhere, thanks to free and open source software. Researchers of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation found that only a third of the population believes in a brighter future. Less than half of our society is satisfied with how our democracy works. In parts of Germany, this drops even further to about a third. Even worse, three out of four Germans feel like politicians don't care about their concerns. And lastly, many people even agree that it doesn't make a difference which parties form the government. Studies like these question the state our democracy is in. Is our democracy broken? Let's take a look at some other results of the same study. Only 1.3% want an authoritative figure with extensive powers to make the law. With the rise of the extreme right, this is a good thing. While 88% of us think that politicians make more promises than they can keep, the majority acknowledges that politicians do have a difficult job. And out of several problems, a great majority identified a lack of participation in elections as the biggest problem. Our democracy generally fails to make everyone happy. And to be fair, that's somewhat the point. But while many people have issues with our democracy, they also seem to believe that it is still the way to go. Democracy is not broken, it is just our implementation of it that is experiencing technical difficulties. Hi, my name is Till, and I'm here to fix this. Not alone, of course, but I'm happy to be, you know, a small aunt just doing what he knows best. And like all those numbers might suggest, I'm not even a political scientist. I'm in fact a designer and web developer. And as such, what I enjoy most is the challenge of making complex concepts easily accessible, preferably with beautiful user interfaces. I'd like to first introduce you to the idea and short history of voting advice applications. 
We will then dig in a little deeper and establish important principles that make VAA successful. There's also going to be a little hands-on with the FOSS project I have developed in the last year. Once I've shown you the tools, I'll talk about how you can run your own election compass and what to consider when doing so. And off we go. Our story begins in the Netherlands. In 1989, the Dutch Citizenship Foundation, the Documentation Center of Dutch Political Parties, and the Faculty of Political Management of the University of Trenton start a collaboration to develop the STEM Visor, a booklet containing 60 statements found in the programs of political parties and the diskette. Well, it's 1989. The idea proves popular and evolves to the first internet election compass for the Dutch parliamentary elections in 1998. Although the project can only attract 6,500 voters, subsequent implementations in 2002 and 2003 attract about 2 million voters, which quickly become 5 million voters in 2006, which is about a third of the entire Dutch population. Success began spreading to other countries. The first election compass I myself ever came across was the German Balomat. Based on the STEM visor itself, the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the BPB, released the first Valomat in 2002. It's fair to say that the VAA concept is now well established in Germany and other countries. Usage in Germany has increased to 33% of cast votes in 2017. Think about that for a moment. One in three voters has used the Valomat at some point before going to the ballot. As software projects of the German government go, this might well be the most successful yet. Doubly so if you consider the costs of some spectacular failures in the past. So what did the first voting advice applications actually look like? Let's take a look at the first Valomat from nearly two decades ago. The internet was quite different back in those days. Many user interface patterns were yet to be discovered or refined and users were less experienced. On a side note, technically, this website from 18 years ago still runs perfectly fine in a modern day browser. Web technologies are amazing. Anyway, despite these slight difficulties and the Valomat being a new concept, there are very few instructions. This is because the core concept was and still is incredibly simple. You are presented with a sequence of statements or theses. You can choose to approve, reject, or remain neutral to a thesis. If you don't really understand the meaning or the issue behind it, you can also skip a thesis. After about 30 statements, you can choose categories that are more important to you, so they are counting double. The political parties or candidates answer the, the same thesis. At the end, your answers are compared to those of the parties, showing you potential matches. Fast forward to today, the idea is about 30 years old now. In this time, it spread not only to Germany, but also to Belgium, Finland, Denmark, Portugal, Norway, Sweden, Austria, Switzerland, and many other countries, continents even. The teams behind Stemwiser inspired most European countries and others around the world. Let's talk about VAAs in more depth. What are they actually good for? Why do people use them? How do their mechanisms work? And does their popularity make them dangerous? So what do we actually want to achieve? What is the purpose of voting advice applications? Since their inception, the target group are actually young, even first-time voters. I guess the reasoning behind this is that the older people get, the more experienced they are with the political landscape. Or at least they should be. The term voting advice application suggests that the purpose is to advise users on who to vote for. Now, I must say, I've been struggling with this name. I find it counterintuitive because 
from what I've seen, this is actually not the purpose of these projects. And that's good because imagine for a second what this would mean. Many VAAs are designed and controlled by government agencies. So who would want to live in a democracy where the government gives you advice on who to vote for in the election? So although it is calling, it's called a, a voting advice application, the Valomat does not actually want to give you advice. It's even written there on the very first page, right above the start button. The Valomat is not a voting advice, but an offer of information about elections and politics. I found this disclaimer in every BAA I have come across so far. Okay, so the purpose of VAAs is, despite their name, not to give voting advice. Good. Except, they kinda do, don't they? We don't give you any advice. Well, we do, but don't take our word for it. We've warned you not to take this as an advice. Now go ahead and get not an advice. Maybe it's just me. But I think this is quite German. VAAs have a positive impact on political education. This might be the main aspect they have originally been designed for. VAAs want to have a positive impact on political education. As I understand it, this topic sadly needs more research. But with the research done so far, we can assume that this is indeed the case. It appears to be uncertain to what extent exactly, and this will also depend on the individual VAA. But there is a positive impact. VAAs do not improve the knowledge about political structures, like how the ballot works, how the allotment of seats in parliament works, etc. But they can improve knowledge about the policy issues, what the upcoming election is about, what parties there are, and where the parties stand. VAAs also lead to discussions about these issues and parties, which can also improve political knowledge in peer groups. So, as far as we know today, this claim is true. And it is an important benefit of election compasses or VAAs, because as research shows, most people in Germany are able to place parties on the spectrum of left and right correctly, but, that, but at the same time, many people are unable to place parties correctly when it comes to policy issues. So, missing political knowledge and misinformation can actually lead to people voting against their own interests. VAAs promote electoral participation. What makes people vote? To answer this question, we can take a look at the reasons why some people don't. And one of the main reasons why some people don't vote is because they don't feel like their position is reflected by any of the existing parties. Our political system is complex and our political landscape, our parties and their programs, doubly so. People that have a better understanding and more knowledge of the choices they have are more likely to cast a vote. Just imagine you're helping a friend who has no clue about computers decide on a graphics card. They either get confused as hell very quickly or they'll be like, well, I don't know, do I even need one? My laptop runs fine and it doesn't have one. Can we get pizza now? You see, being able to make an informed decision can make a huge difference. And VAAs can help with that. And research tells us that VAA users can be 2 to 12% more likely to go to the ballot. The last important background topic I would like to touch on is the matching algorithm. These algorithms are still subject to debate and some are frequently criticized. I'll spare you the history and instead we'll jump right in because one, this topic deserves a talk of its own and two, that talk should not be held by me. But I'll share with you what I know. The matching algorithm is responsible for calculating your result. After you answered all the, the all the theses, your answers are compared to those of the parties. The parties get more points, the more you agree with them. Sounds simple, but how do you calculate this exactly? Say we have an agreement scale of 10 to minus 10. 
I reply to a given thesis with an agreement of three. Party A is even more into this and goes for nine. Party B is not a fan of this thesis and answers with minus three. How many points will party A and B get for this thesis? There are two approaches to this. The first has been coined the proximity model, and as the term suggests, it focuses on the distance between two points. In this case, party A and party B are in the same distance to my answer, so they will get the same amount of points. Seems logical at first, but is this really the best approach to this? I might not fully agree with party A, but I am on the same side, whereas party B is on the other side. Wouldn't it be safe to assume that party A is a better match for me? Well, probably yes. The idea is called the directional model. It awards more points if the voter and the party go in the same direction. In our scenario, party A will receive more points than party B because it is on the same side as I am. Following these models, one can easily create a matching algorithm. While not all VAAs make their algorithms public, there are a few well-known ones. The first is the famous city block algorithm. It belongs to the proximity model and is still used by the Valomat, albeit with only three options, which has been criticized in the past. In this chart, you can see the user's answer in the rows and the party's answer in the columns. In the cell where they meet, you find the score for this thesis. For example, if I choose to strongly approve the thesis, uh, I'm in the first row. If the party agrees on that, we meet in the first cell and the party gets the maximum score of one for this thesis. If the party, however, rejects the thesis, first row, fourth column, it will only get a score of minus five. You see, the city block algorithm strictly follows the proximity model. The closer user and party become, the higher the score. The classic example of the directional model is the scalar algorithm. The direction or side is far more important here, and a party cannot receive the positive score as long as it is on the other side of the user's opinion. Note also that this must mean that if either the user or the party choose a neutral position, the score will always be zero. So while both algorithms have their strengths, our goal is to find a model that's prediction is as close as possible to what the user votes for in the end. And there's another group of algorithms that tend to yield better results. I'm talking about hybrid algorithms that try to combine the approaches of the proximity and directional model. As you can see, proximity as well as direction play a role in the scoring. Looking at the colors, you can see that this now looks a bit like the first algorithm, the city block algorithm, but the green line fades a little in the center. This is the influence of the scalar algorithm focusing on the direction. So which one is best? I'm afraid we don't know for sure. As always, data will tell. It also depends on your intentions and design choices. What we do know is that algorithms based on the proximity model tend to favor temperate parties, while those based on the directional model gently pushes users to the extreme ends. Considering this, hybrid algorithms should yield more balanced results. We must not forget, though, that at the end of the day, they are still only models, so don't expect any of them to be incredibly accurate.
The Open Election Compass is a free and open source software with a simple mission. Making voting advice applications available to every election to support political education and democracy everywhere. Running your own election compass can be a costly endeavor. No more. With the Open Election Compass, we have a system that is free, transparent, user-friendly and accessible. Unlike agencies who only run an election compass every few years, a project like this can focus on continuous improvement. But enough promises. Let's take a look at the features. The Open Election Compass was designed to be easy to use and accessible. The design is minimalistic, so users are not distracted. Unlike solutions like the Valomat, it makes use of the available screen size with big theses and buttons. Clear color coding provides visual feedback. And as you can see, the navigation is not based on previous next buttons, but scrolling. This is quicker and far more intuitive, especially on mobile devices. To make this experience even smoother, a big friendly green button helps guide the user through the entire process. Whenever it's time to move on, it just pops up, ready to take you to the next step. The Open Election Compass is the first VAA software to pioneer this navigation concept. With great success, I might add. Everything you are seeing here is also screen reader and keyboard friendly. These things get easily overlooked, but as I said, being a continuous project, we can focus on important details like these. After we have finished the, th the theses, we are guided to the selection of the parties. Notice that unlike most VAAs, there's no additional step here where we would be asked to select some theses that are more important to us. This is another way Open Election Compass is improving and speeding up the process. We are removing the cognitive overhead of going through all these theses again. Instead, you can mark a thesis as important right, right while you're answering. Usability-wise, this makes a lot more sense. But back to the parties. We simply select the parties we would like to compare, again, keyboard and screen reader friendly, and proceed to the results. Here we have the classic percentage-based result view. With most VAAs, this is pretty much it. Usually, you can go into the theses one by one and see the statements of the parties, but I believe this is the most important part and should not be hidden away. Showing these statements should be the default. So I made it the default. When we scroll further, we can read the answers of all selected parties in an easy, color-coded, chat-like format. And that's it. A simple to use, accessible, beautiful, state-of-the-art and free voting advice application. Now comes my favorite part. How do you get all this content, the theses, the parties, the statements into the Open Election Compass? Well, of course, by using a big JSON configuration file. That's hardly exciting. But you know what? JSON is simple, but for a non-programmer, this is a pretty daunting task. And even for programmers, working with big JSON files to manage content in multiple languages is not something particularly fun, especially if it involves countless emails back and forth to incorporate small changes. So guess what? There's a tool for that. Now everyone can read and write the JSON configuration files using a friendly visual editor called the configuration editor. It makes adding parties, theses and statements a breeze. Simply fill in the forms and download your ready-to-go configuration file. It even supports adding every content in multiple languages and handles images for you. 
there is 100% feature parity between the configuration files and the editor. And while this is only the first step in making the creation of VAAs more accessible, it is a big step up from any other tool. And there's more. Let me introduce some of the smaller features that make the Open Election Compass special. I really want to make this technology accessible for everyone. So I took the time to create a single file deployment solution that will fit the software, your content and images all in a single HTML file. Is that the most performant solution? No, but let's be reasonable. It's perfectly fine for a small town. Definitions. Theses must be short and precise. Sometimes this makes it difficult for users to understand them because of words or abbreviations they might not know. To help with this, you can easily provide small helpers. Solid navigation. As we have seen, the one-page design approach comes with lots of benefits. To make sure no one gets annoyed by too much scrolling around, an intelligent menu is always right at hand. That and the big green button helps getting around in no time at all. Multilingual. The Open Election Compass has been multilingual since the very beginning. And not just the interface, no. You can easily provide theses and answers, everything in multiple languages. Even though this is not a big issue in Germany, I was thinking about countries like Switzerland, where this can be essential, really. Kiosk mode. You can set up a terminal in a public place and put your election compass in kiosk mode. This mode will ask users nicely to reset the application once they are done or will do so automatically after a period of inactivity. Algorithms. The Open Election Compass has a flexible matching implementation that allows it to support different answer styles and algorithms, because we don't know what might be the best fit for you. Privacy first statistics. The Open Election Compass now comes with an integrated tool to collect statistics in a privacy, privacy first design. Users can opt in to submit their answers anonymously for research. They can also help to improve the quality of the dataset by answering more questions regarding their age, gender, education, and more. I know that this is a difficult topic, so I'm taking extra care to get this right. We certainly don't want to become a privacy nightmare. We want to help people support science in the most privacy caring way possible. By now, you'll probably want to get started building your own election compass. Next up, DIY. There are a number of principles when creating a VAA, written down in the Lausanne Declaration. If you want to run your own election compass, I encourage you to read it. It's not even long. Let's go over the most important points quickly. In order to contribute sustainably to the good functioning of democracy, VAAs should be open, transparent, impartial, and methodologically sound. This is important because if you're not transparent, there's a good chance that some people or even parties try to deny your legitimacy or impartiality. You should really follow the approach, we have nothing to fear because we have nothing to hide. A VAA should be freely accessible to all citizens. This is fairly obvious, but anyway, make sure that your VAA does not require any form of payment. This could be the paywall of a media outlet you've partnered with for promotion, but this could also be less obvious, a mandatory collection of statistics. And lastly, keep in mind that there are probably more people with disabilities that, than you might be aware of. The Open Election Compass helps you with that as it provides decent screen reader support and generally follows accessibility guidelines.
But you should also apply these design principles for any other content you might create, you might create around your VAA. A VAA should aim at the inclusion of as many parties or candidates that are on the ballot as possible. The criteria for the exclusion of parties and candidates should be publicly available and justified. And also, parties and candidates should not be excluded from the tool for ideological reasons. I think this might be the most obvious rule, but also the most important. We want to help voters make informed choices, so we need as many parties to participate as possible. This might at times be a little difficult when parties don't want to partake, but more on that later. VAAs should be designed in a simple and intuitively understandable manner. Open Election Compass. This is the reason why the design of the Open Election Compass is not fancy at all. A bit boring even, because I genuinely believe that it's how it's supposed to be. Many designers observe that web interfaces are starting to look alike too much, and there's some truth to that. But this is mainly because we have established a number of patterns that just work and are well known to users. So with the Open Election Compass, I'm in fact building upon that. If you want an interface that is usable by as many people as possible, boring is better than fancy. This is not art, this is design. The Lausanne Declaration holds ourselves to a high standard, but as the original author stated, it is meant as a starting point for discussion. There are a few points I would like to add. VAAs should collect user data only on an unobtrusive opt-in basis. You might want to collect user data, such as visitor statistics, answers, and polls. There are good reasons to do so, but it should only ever happen with a clear opt-in solution, preferably near the end of the inaction compass. A project like this should not appear greedy. VAAs should collect user data for science, not for profit. The collected data should be made publicly available. If you collect statistics in your VAA, do it for science. Let political scientists handle the methodology and interpretation, not some newspaper. And after the election is done, make the data you collected and, if possible, your research available for free. VAAs should collect user data in a way that is not possible, that it is not possible to trace political opinions back to an individual. If you do collect statistics, make it impossible to connect answers to a name, not only for everyone else, but for yourself. If you want to collect contact information for further research, save it separately from the user's answers. Users trust the VAA, so be trustworthy. Okay, so where to begin? I prepared instructions how to run your own election compass consisting of 10 phases. Phase number one, preparing. Organization, planning, and communication are paramount. Before you do anything else, make sure you're all on the same page. Do you really want to run an election compass? Who is going to manage everything? This person doesn't have to, and in fact shouldn't do everything alone. But it is very beneficial to have a single person feeling responsible that everyone else completes their assignments on time. Write down your own timeline. Get a tool to organize your team like Kanban board or a to-do app. Phase number two, your team. You should never run a VAA all on your own, not just because it's an awful lot of work and responsibility and requires an extensive skill set but because it is nearly impossible to do it in a legitimate way. You want to support the democratic process, so get a team of experts, advisors, and supporters working together. Start with a list of people. 
This might include political scientists for advice and possibly in charge of the thesis, a marketing specialist managing your marketing channel, social media, email, etc. Uh, a web developer with technical skills to get the election compass online, um, a media designer, uh, enthusiastic citizens, people with good connections to the administration, newspapers and other institutions, um, someone with great language skills for wording and spelling. Um, think of people that might fit into these positions and contact them. Organize a kickoff meeting for your entire team to present your project, the plan, the structure, the timeline. Establish your organization tools and communication channel. Um, get everyone to work, gather to-dos and assign them, and set deadlines. Phase number three, the parties. It is important to get the parties on board. Normally, one party alone has no choice but to, but to participate. You wouldn't want to be the only party missing. But if multiple parties aren't interested, you have a serious problem. You should not run an election compass with some parties missing. One or two small parties might be tolerable. Um, you can simply ask for a gathering and give them a rough idea what you are planning. At this point, it can be very helpful to belong to a reputable institution whose invitation cannot easily be refused. Most of the time, parties should welcome your idea, but be prepared for some persuading anyways. Phase number four, preparing the workshop. The thesis for your election compass obviously cannot be written all by yourself. They need to represent the society as a whole. The choice of theses decides over the quality of your election compass. You need to get this right. Your theses need to cover the most important matters for the next legislature. Uh, they need to be objective and impartial. The wording of the theses has to be simple enough to be understood and to the point. Take this task seriously. It is the most important and the most difficult. To achieve theses of good quality, you should run a workshop with a sample of your audience. Um, gather a group of young, probably first-time voters, but if you like, you can also gather voters of all ages. Make sure the group is representable for your audience. No gender, race, or religion should be excluded, obviously. Set a date and find a large enough room with a projector, send out invitations, and gather replies. Your group should have about 20 to 30 members. Get the political programs of all participating parties. Um, with the help of your experts, gather topics of political interest from the programs and newspapers and sort them into categories like social environment, work, traffic, infrastructure, energy, economy, finance, tax, security, you get the gist. This is your workshop material. Now plan the workshop. Help your group of voters discover the topics and create the theses. What methods are you going to use? Um, teachers can be very helpful here. What materials will you need? Whiteboards, pens, paper? etc. Phase number five, the theses. Use the topics and information you gathered to conduct your workshop with your team and your group of voters. In this workshop, you will create a number of theses. Most selection compasses gather around 50 to even 100 theses for whole countries at this stage. It will take you a few hours at least. Take care of your guests with, you know, pauses, lunch, snacks, and coffee. Collect all theses in a list and don't forget to work on the wording. Now, regarding the theses, there are some simple rules and some more advanced rules. The simple ones are these. Can the theses, the, the theses be easily understood by everyone? Are there words that not everyone will know? The Open Action Compass can provide hints on those over for those. 
might the wording be biased? Um, does the wording match your style? Uh, is this a good length? You know, these kind of simple rules. Now, for the more advanced rules, it can be quite hard to follow these, but you should at least try or maybe get some help with these. Advanced rule number one. Theses should not be about ideological values, but actual political policies. The first statement is completely vague. Voters cannot get any political knowledge from this because ideologically, they most likely already know where the parties are standing. What's even worse, voters can interpret this thesis very differently. So be concrete. Number two, theses should not be double-barreled. It is very easy to accidentally merge two theses, and that makes them hard to answer. Every thesis should be about one policy and not mix two or more policies. In this example, voters might be okay with soft but not hard drugs. So how are they supposed to answer the first statement? Focus your theses. Number three, theses should avoid quantifications. At first, this thesis looks fine. It's clear and short, but what if you don't think there should be more surveillance, surveillance cameras? If I reject this statement, what does it mean? It could mean that I'm okay with the numbers of cameras, or it could mean that I'm completely against them. It's not clear, and this makes it hard to match parties and voters. It's often difficult to avoid, to avoid quantification, but sometimes it can help to get down to the real issue. And in case of my hometown, this was that some people um, don't feel safe in public places at night. Now it's more of a Boolean question. So try to go for these. And number four, um, theses should avoid qualifications as well. This is a bit like the third rule, only this time uh, we don't merge related theses, but add more depth to a thesis uh, by adding an example. This was taken from the Valumat of 2002, and while it was meant to just be an example, um, it makes it more difficult both for the voters as well as the matching algorithm. Voters might support gay marriages, but draw a line when it comes to adoption. So what do they choose? In this case, it might be helpful to be more specific or even split this into two separate theses. This brings us to phase number six, the positions. Now it's time to let the parties answer and position them themselves. First, decide on the algorithm you want to calculate the matches with. This will also determine how many possible answers there will be. Send the theses to every party. You'll want to use an online form or similar, as the task of collecting all answers can get very tedious. Make also sure to collect the logos in an appropriate quality and give the parties two to three weeks to answer, depending on your timeline. In the meantime, prepare to publish the election compass. Um, Contact media outlets and tell them about your story. Contact the administration and ask them if they are willing to put up a link on their website. Uh, contact schools, teachers, youth organizations and sport clubs and ask them if they are willing to share some graphics and link uh, with their followers once you're done. Phase number seven, evaluating the answers you now have a lot of theses and even more answers. The next step is to select the most important theses. You can do this in another workshop or in your team. Go through every thesis and decide whether it should become part of the election compass. 
ask yourselves, is this thesis controversial enough? Um, is it helpful in telling the parties apart? Uh, at this stage, around 25 to 40 theses remain. Too few and the results lose accuracy. Too many and it will take too long for the voters to process them. Phase number eight, time for a test. By now, you should have everything you need. Let's run a test. Feed your theses, answers and logos to the configuration editor to create the configuration file. Try it out, give it to your team and the people that participated in your workshops. Gather their feedback, make small adjustments until everything is ready for the big day. Phase number nine, going public. About two to three weeks before the election, you should publish your election compass. Tell your web developer in advance and when the election compass is online, tell everyone. And lastly, phase number 10, observe. Everything is up and running? Good. The only thing left to do now is get your election compass into as many hands as possible. Be available for questions and feedback from the public and then wait for the election. Don't forget to vote yourselves. And when the election is over, archive the election compass. You can delete it, of course, but if you can, just keep it online. It can still be a valuable resource of transparency. If you collected any data for research, make sure to share it with the world. And lastly, please give back to the Open Election Compass. Give feedback, write about it, or improve our funding. And here we are, nearly done. Undoubtedly, there are many issues with democracy. Its implementations are incredibly complex and nothing that comes out of it is ever perfect. It can be frustratingly slow, inefficient, intransparent, and even counterproductive. But it's also the only form of government that the majority so far managed to agree upon. And it's also the only form of government that is evolving continuously. We are right to criticize the system when it appears to be moving in the wrong direction. But we should not be tempted to hack our democracy. Hacking the system would mean bending it to our will. We don't want that. And we don't need to. We don't need to hack a system that has the inherent ability to change. We can, however, try and fix the flaws. And I believe voting advice applications are a way to start doing this. A way of patching democracy. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Till Sanders, not only for your lecture, but also for the development of this um, like very useful tool, obviously. Um, we still have some questions that uh, our community posed uh, on our social media platforms. Um, I would start with the first one, like um, who would be moderating the content in such apps? Like, would it be peer moderated? Would it be state election agency or would it be something third? Like what kind of, um, yeah. Uh, moderation would there be? Mm, that's that's a very important question, actually. Um, so uh, in Germany, with the Valomat, um, that's made by by the BPB um, government agency, um, and they develop it in a workshop um, like the one that I described in the talk, um, together with uh, young first-time voters, um, because that's the that's their target group. Um, but apart from that, they obviously have, you know, political scientists, people who've been doing this for two decades now. Um, and um, if you want to do it yourself, you won't have access to these to these kind of resources. Um, so that's that that can be a problem. Um, and um, 
so far it, it worked well. Um, we did this in, in Münster, Cologne, uh, Bielefeld and uh, uh, Siegen. And um, we had a team of political scientists who did this. So they had all the expertise. Um, and yeah, there's, there's no, no perfect answer for this. Um, not, not anyone, not everybody has these, these resources. Um, just try to, to do it as good as you can and maybe get some contacts who can help you. Um, and um, we must not forget it's only for political education, not for actual voting advice. So it will never be perfect, but um, to a certain degree, that's okay. But there is a question that is kind of subsequently to the previous one. Um, like, if this person is wondering, how do you or how do we make sure that the data is not corrupted, like uh, that it's not abused for a political promotion, for example, or um, something like this? Like, they um, refer to um, a big removing of Twitter of 20k fake accounts um, that tweeted political propaganda. Uh, in kinds of millions of tweets, and those uh, were from a couple of countries that uh, discovered in April 2020. So how could one prevent this in a way, or is it like the same that you uh, already stated concerning the first question? Yeah, well, that's that's also um, a problem. Uh, it hasn't proven to be a problem so far. Um, so as far as I know, um, there has been no case where this happened. But it, it could obviously happen. Um, and uh, since my tool and a few other tools um, are open source, um, there's no way we can stop this. Um, but actually, that's the case for, for uh, many projects out there, not only in this field. Um, so many, many open source projects can, can be abused. Um, Let's look at curl. I think the developer of curl is still not allowed to enter uh, the United States because uh, they think he's a hacker. <laughs> um, the only thing we can really do is um, educate people about this topic in general and um, also improve education on um, VAAs um, themselves. So don't take them too serious. And then maybe take which ones are uh, not honest. Yeah, this is actually a question that uh, bothers or bugs um, the users a lot because another question is like, um, how could we ensure that there is no bias um, in the questions, which like actually connects um, like to the previous questions as well. But they were wondering, um, for example, if the questions per topic are not evenly uh, distributed, which yeah actually tends to uh, lead to some kind of bias um, in the questions, but like this is the same problem like with open source material, obviously, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah that's that's a problem. Um, so in, in Münster um, this year, um, there was another uh, election compass based on the open election compass, uh, and it, it was from the, the Bund Jugend. Um, so they focused on environmental issues and it was a completely separate project. Um, and uh, it wasn't even the first time they were doing this. In the past, they did it with um, like flyers and, and stuff. Um, and I guess their election compass probably was biased mm. um, because it was part of their campaign, you could say. I mean, they're not the party, but still. Um, and I think what's most important is that um, it's transparent who is who is doing this election compass. Um, so in Lüdenscheid, it was a general youth organization not affiliated with any parties, um, uh, funded by the government. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's a different stand really to do that. Um, on the other hand, the project in, in Münster wasn't bad. It was biased, yes, um, but that doesn't make it a bad project. Just people have to be aware of that. And um, I hope we can tackle all these problems in the future with um, something that's more like platform as a service, 
um, maybe maybe we can build an institution around this um, that can um, govern all these projects and, and moderate them a little bit. But maybe that's just a trade-in. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but um, another question that popped up that I find quite interesting as well is um, why VAAs can successfully approximate a given user's political stand in comparison to the party's answers to the thesis. Um, I thought, like, the user thought a lot about another issue, the missing knowledge on a thesis actual context. Like, they were wondering if you have an idea how to solve that with a similar um, technology-driven tool or something, like, um, actually... Uh, Yeah, uh, that's a question I've had for a while. Uh, <laughs> when I first did the, the Valomat, um, that question popped up for me as well. Um, because there were some questions I didn't know anything about. Um, and the idea is um, that you just skip those questions and they completely, they are not counted. Um, that's how they deal with it. But I, I always thought, um, why don't they tell me more about it so I can make an informed choice? Um, so far, I, I haven't managed to find the definite answer to this, but um, now I, I believe they they don't do it on purpose. So they they do it on purpose that they don't do it. You know, um, <laughs> I, I think I think um, the risk would be too high to influence users um, because when when the election compass itself tells you um, everything you need to know about this topic, um, uh, they decide what's true, what what information they give you about this topic. And um, I think it's incredibly difficult to be really objective when, when creating such content. Um, so I guess that's the reason why, why they don't do it. And I think it's a good reason actually. So people should get information somewhere else, multiple sources. So you would not uh, lobby for some kind of option that you could, you know, uh, expand like your uh, open source project, for example, to um, cover that one as well? No, um, I, I don't think so. Actually, if you um, scroll down all the way, you can see the party's answers. Um, and I, I did it on purpose that, um, yeah, that you can, it's, it's more like a chat. Um, so they can actually discuss that in a way and you can read their answers um, and then decide what what who you believe yeah all right um you are um actually doing this um by yourself you founded this a year ago um or uh, some bit in prior because uh, you saw the problems that were there um but uh, how could one uh, join the party like how could one help out how could uh, somebody um work with you on this project Yeah, well, so I have lots of ideas um, how you could improve this project. Um, and so far, I'm, I'm managing fine to do it on my own in my free time. Um, and I don't intend to do it like full time. Um, it's, it's a good side project, but uh, someday I think more people should get involved. involved. Um, and uh, there are several, several ways to do so. Um, so the project is based on uh, Vue.js um, and everyone who is uh, familiar with that can easily um, join. Um, there are small and big to-dos that, that could be done. Um, and many ideas will require um, a server-side application. Um, so that's something I've been working on in, in the past uh, few weeks. Um, so that's also something that, that could um, attract um, contributors. Okay. Um, and um, another question I have left uh, would be, uh, will the slides be, uh, be available somewhere? Like, uh, do you have your presentation somewhere uh, online so people who are interested, uh, who love the design and content, like the user who posed this question, um, could uh, still grab it somehow. Um, thanks, first. Um, <laughs> yeah, surely. Um, the project already has um, a website 
um, and many uh, things in the presentation are also on the website. Um, but everything, but I will I will add them um, in the next days, I think. And um, as far for the slides, um, I I can I, I will upload them somewhere unless um, I don't know you you do that. Um, I don't know you you have like um, this hack media side where you where you post some videos. So we have to um, uh, we are allowed to put them online for you. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> They will definitely be available somewhere. Okay, amazing. Is there something left for you to say to that you just want to get off your heart? Um, well, I really enjoyed doing this. Um, and uh, I myself learned a lot about um, VAAs in the process. That was nice. And um, um, I'm just happy that so many people listen to it. So <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for being here, for your presentation, for your uh, work, of course, um, and uh, yeah, for being here, for joining us. Uh, we will uh, go ahead on this channel with um, air filters. Um, it starts at 8 um, p.m., of course, and uh, it will be some sort of um, uh, instruction how to build your own air filters um, that actually get your air clean and virus free. Um, by using your 3D printer. Uh, for now, uh, we say thank you very much and say um, see you the next time. <laughs>